to officially open the Understanding the Impacts of Man-Made Disasters on Child Health webinar, it is my great honor to welcome our first speaker, Professor Amon Pulungan, as the Executive Director of the International Pediatric Association. Without further ado, to the professor who needs no introduction, to Professor Pulungan, the time and screen is yours. Hello, I'm Professor Aman Pulungan. On behalf of International Pediatric Association, I would like to welcome you to the webinar title, Understanding the Impact of Man-Made Disaster on Child Health, organized by International Pediatric Association Strategic Advisory Group on Children in Humanitarian Emergencies. Man-Made Disaster are the result of negligence involving a failure of system made by humans. The variation of man-made disaster, including floods, landslide, forest fires, pollution, lead exposure, armed conflict, wars, etc., are still a problem to be managed by countries across the globe. The health consequence resulting from this disaster will largely negatively impact vulnerable groups, particular children. Environmental changes, waste and pollution caused by men have an impact on child health. An endocrine disruptor is an exogenous substance that causes adverse health effect in intact organism or its progeny, consequent to changes in endocrine function. For example, exposure to endocrine disruptor chemical through foods and beverage consumed, pesticide applied, and cosmetic use may result in developmental, reproductive, brain, immune, and other health problems. These chemicals present in plastic bottles and containers, liners of metal foods, cans, detergent, flame, retardant, food, toys, cosmetic, and pesticides are slow to break down in the environment and will cause hazardous impact on health. Knowing that the incidence of both acute and chronic disease have been increasing over the past several years, this may even correlate with the hazardous chemicals that threaten our health. Therefore, it is important that every country every doctor every citizen are aware of this issue and help alert stakeholders to take action on how to reduce and manage man-made disaster especially for every child every age everywhere we are honored to have dr merit schreiber and dr michelle Nishirenko as speakers of this webinar who will help us understand more on how to help children during man-made disaster. Moreover, I would like to thank Dr. Halim Enes and Dr. Leila Namazosa Baranova for taking the lead role as moderators of this webinar. Finally, the webinar would not be complete without our participants. And thus, I extend my warmest gratitude to all who have attended today. I hope this webinar will enrich your knowledge about the impact of man-made disaster on child health. The recording of this webinar will also be uploaded to YouTube. And please kindly share this information with your network. Thank you for your attention and let us welcome our moderator and speakers. Hello, I'm Professor Aman Pulung. Thank you, Professor Pulungan, for your opening remarks. The next agenda of our webinar will be moderated by a very special and distinguished moderators. It is my great honor today to introduce our moderators for the session. Dr. Halim Hennes is a professor of pediatric emergency medicine physician. He is the past president of the Wisconsin chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics and the immediate past chief of the pediatric emergency medicine at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. He has also served as the chair of the pediatric emergency medicine interest group at the Academic 
Pediatric Societies, Editorial Board of the Signa Vitae, and Turkish Journal of Pediatric Emergency and Critical Care Medicine. In 1995, he has also received the Distinguished Service Award from the Egyptian Society of Surgeons for his work on advancing emergency services in Egypt. Thank you for joining us tonight, Doctor. I will now introduce the second moderator of our session. Professor Leila Namazova Baranova is the head of the pediatric department in Pirogov Russian National Research Medical University of the Ministry of of Health of the Russian Federation, head of the Research Institute of Pediatric and Child Health in the Central Clinical Hospital of the Russian Academy of Sciences of the Ministry of Science and Higher Education of the Russian Federation. She is the leading expert of preventative medicine in the Ministry of Health, chairman of the National Immunization Technical Advisory Group, and head of the working group of the ECNICMA project in Russia. Without further ado, to Professor Navazova Barnova, the time and place is yours. If we are discussing a topic that unfortunately has become extremely relevant in recent years, the suffering of children uh, as a result of humanitarian disasters, uh, not natural disasters, but produced by people themselves. Uh, we are pediatricians, not politicians, so our goal today is not to discuss who is to blame and what, but to sort out in detail how we professionals help, uh, can help children um, must help children, our patients in these terrible situations. And we will analyze how we should act, how to prepare better and what professionals should know about that. So it's my great uh, pleasure now to um, present um, our distinguished speaker, uh, Dr. Mary Schreiber, uh, who is professor of uh, uh, clinical pediatrics in the Department of Pediatrics in Harbor UCLA Medical Center. Lundquist Institute and Senior Advisor, Terrorism and Disaster Program, National Center for Child Traumatic Stress, and the David Gettin School of Medicine at UCLA. He serves as a lead for the Mental Health Work Group for the Western Regional Alliance for Pediatric Emergency Management, co-lead uh, of the Mental Health Domain, uh, Pediatric Pandemic Network, and the Chair of Disaster Response for the uh, California Psychological Association. Dr. Schreiber has developed various tools and the pediatric disaster mental health uh, concepts designed to provide population level response tactics to all hazard events impacting children, youth, and families. Uh, Professor uh, Schreiber, uh, now the floor is yours. Well, uh, greetings everyone around the world. It's very exciting to be with you. I'm going to bring up my presentation now, if that's okay. So I should stop right at the bottom of the hour, is that right? Um, the presentation is not here. Ah, uh, yeah, for the full screen, please. Here we go. Is that visible? Yeah, great, thanks. Okay. Well, hi everyone. So uh, yeah, I'm a clinical child psychologist. Uh, I was a community mental health provider in Orange County, California. And then in the mid nineties, we had a very large wildfire that was actually human caused, uh, burned uh, 40,000 acres and resulted in the uh, the fire you see on the top left. And I got really very interested in uh, both the acute and the long-term response to children and families after large-scale disasters. So this little community of about 35,000, little beach community has about 6,000 kids in the public school system. All of them were evacuated very rapidly. Some of them on foot, they couldn't get buses in there quick enough. So literally some of the kids were running for their lives uh, kind of in those hills you see uh, just about a mile from the Pacific Ocean. So that launched a change in my career and I became uh, what some people call a disaster junkie. I joined all sorts of um, U.S. civilian uh, medical response teams 
I went to the Boston Marathon, actually, where our colleague uh, uh, works at Children's Hospital in Boston. Uh, I went to a large school shooting for the U.S. government uh, in Sandy Hook. Supported the CDC response to the tsunami in Southeast Asia a number of years ago and those sorts of events. So anyway, I, I'm an academic, but at in my heart of hearts, I'm kind of a responder. And I am pleased to tell you that we're part of two new U.S. national initiatives that we've been uh, wanting to have for a long time. One of them is called RAPM, and it is a consortia of six Western states focused on uh, interdisciplinary health response to children in disasters. A lot of academic centers, uh, University of Washington, Oregon Health Sciences, UC Davis, UC San Francisco is the lead, Stanford Valley Children's, Children's Hospital, LA, USC, and my own institution. Uh, and the idea is to really uh, move things forward in response to kids kind of regionally. And then another companion effort that's uh, just um, about four weeks in its most recent iteration is called the Pediatric Pandemic Network. And this is a national initiative led by 10 children's hospitals, 10 hubs, representing different parts of the United States. And this is just coming together now. And I'm part of the mental health component, but there is a surge response, there's an infectious disease, a chem bio, a training, uh, all sorts of different uh, tele behavioral health, telehealth, um, planning, uh, interregional coordination uh, designed to improve our U.S. response to kids in disasters. So why focus on kids um, on the mental health side? Because we know that children are among the highest risk uh, population uh, essentially worldwide. And we know that families with children represent a, a large segment of disaster affected populations. And uh, at least here, there's uh, not been a huge focus on the unique needs of children and families. That's why we're so excited about these two uh, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services uh, efforts, the Pediatric Pandemic Network and the Pediatric disaster centers of excellence. Those two initiatives are really changing our focus on this. And it's frontline medical providers that are uniquely positioned, I think, to help us identify kids at higher risk that will need timely linkage to uh, more uh, sustained mental health care. And we also know kind of as a sidelight that caring for seriously ill and injured children, especially in large surge events where uh, there may uh, result in uh, altered standards of care or crisis standards of care, as we call it here. We already know there's a, a surplus of burnout and PTSD in frontline medical providers, secondary traumatic stress, and it's certainly worse in, in the post-COVID uh, era, at least here in the U.S. So basically what happens in acute traumatic events, so if the disaster is human caused or natural, intentional or unintentional, it's extremely common in adults and kids to have transitory distress, it's ubiquitous. So it's isolated symptoms, uh, insomnia, for example, fears of recurrence, but many people in that group within hours, days or weeks spontaneously kind of return to their baseline without any outside uh, professional mental health intervention. So it could be things like psych first aid, psychological first aid, or psychosocial support, as it's kind of referred to in the international community. That might facilitate the uh, trajectory of uh, resolution of distress. But there's also a subset. So on the right, in the red circle, there's um, looking at kind of uh, the summary of the research literature that's out there, there's a risk for those that have a direct impact of around 20 to 40% getting a new disorder they didn't have before. So this is syndromal. This is going on for more than 30 days and the severity of the symptoms is causing them impairment in their ability to carry out their daily activities. So for school, for kids, or, you know, functioning in their families and peer relationships. And 
now we think that when you do get a disorder, it's usually co-occurring. So it seems like PTSD is kind of the gateway syndrome, but frequently it's not on its own in nature. It's frequently co-occurs with things like depression, some of the behavioral problems in kids, et cetera. And we also know that there's a tremendous uh, surplus of prior trauma. So social determinants of health in the US, there's uh, a lot of interest now in something called adverse child, childhood early experiences or ACEs, and those also contribute to risk. So my work is trying to figure out who's headed uh, on that sort of green trajectory with the stress, but not necessarily long-term syndromal issues or severe uh, enduring symptoms and, and don't have impairment versus those that do. So that's kind of where the triage comes in. And there's emerging evidence, I think, that if we get to this high-risk subset uh, or as early as possible, so technically it takes 30 days after an acute traumatic event to have a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. If we get to them very early on, we identify a high-risk subset and we link them to certain evidence-based practices with adults, there's some evidence that the risk pathway can be interrupted and maybe PTSD even prevented. Uh, the research with children is behind that. It, we're not quite there yet, but that's certainly an area where I'm interested in working. So a classic example is a study that was done in Australia by Richard Bryant uh, years ago with adult motor vehicle accident uh, traumatic injury patients. And those that were screened and linked to just four hours of a certain kind of intervention, and it wasn't a debriefing, it was a form of acute uh, cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT. Those that got four hours of that intervention within that first 30 days had positive benefits compared to a randomized control group even four years later. So it seems to me that four hours targeted to a high risk group in a critical window of opportunity is a, you know, uh, public health potential to reduce and mitigate the burden of PTSD. Challenging to do in the real world, but that's kind of where we're at. And we know that it is, it is the case that over time, intentional uh, uh, incidents seem to have a higher, more enduring uh, level of, uh, post-traumatic stress symptoms. This is adults. Uh, it looks like non-intentional events uh, higher on the front end by about month three, the trajectory change. It's still increased over baseline, but um, uh, it, the intentional definitely, you know, violence seems to definitely contribute to more enduring issues. We know the kids have a range of reactions from transitory distress to risk of or exacerbation of prior disorders. I'm not big on the acute stress disorder diagnosis. I don't think it's a reliable indicator of long-term risk of resilience out 30 days. So we look for indicators actually of post-traumatic stress disorder. And we have to recognize this seems to be an issue in disaster mental health in the US that one size does not fit all. And there's really a continuum of risk and a matched continuum of interventions that we need to do beyond one shot things like debriefing or psych first aid. So when it comes to screening, which is what I've been asked to talk about, it's really what are you screen for? Are you looking for high distress in the acute aftermath? Are you looking at those with a mix of symptoms, but still subsyndromal using the diagnostic criteria? Are you looking for full syndrome or what we're now calling kind of transdiagnostic, those with multiple uh, syndromes? With kids, we know that you really do need to look at subsyndromal also, because even um, that subsyndromal group tend to have significant impairment in school over time. So just looking at diagnostic groups, not sufficient, but probably not an overfocus on on just the stress. Uh, the APA, our APA, American Psychological Association, uh, had a task force on children and trauma about nine years ago uh, actually produced some, uh, I think, uh, not just for disasters, but for trauma in general, I think really important. And one of the things they recommended was, quote, routine triage and screening for traumatic exposures recommended in large-scale screening efforts to identify 
uh, children's, uh, children who are experiencing problems may be warranted. Not easily done. I'm not sure it's done in a uh, organized way here. And we've developed a, a sort of a continuum from a seamless screening and triage to clinical assessment to linkage to evidence-based practice. We do have some national measures that we already collect. We have something called the Youth Behavior Risk Surveillance System, which is from our CDC, which looks at suicide, exposure to violence in the community, uh, sexual behavior, there's a lot of demographic data. We have other kinds of data that you know uh, individual communities capture. Well, that kind of is sometimes only, that's the only baseline we have. And then our idea in the acute aftermath is uh, a rapid triage approach, which is non-symptom based, and then essentially to funnel, uh, successfully funnel, uh, kids that look like they're at risk to more intensive uh, screening uh, tools and practices that involve, uh, they're more invasive, they require more training, uh, they're more complicated to, uh, to launch. There's been some really nice efforts internationally. This is from uh, MGAP and WHO and UNHCR. This is available. All you have to do is Google it. Uh, this is not specific to kids. But it is an approach to um, specifically look at more uh, common approaches to management of stress. And then we have a model. Uh, and basically, our model is called SciStar. We in the US, we have a common medical triage system called START. So I wanted to integrate our system into the medical arena, not have a completely detached mental health. Uh, approach because lots of times uh, my experience is mental health and the medical response are very separated and we really need to integrate if we're going to identify kids early because many of the highest risk kids are those that you all encounter in uh, emergency care and acute care settings in primary care. So our tool is designed to be very simply implemented. It does not use uh, uh, symptoms, it uses traumatic exposure, traumatic experience, and loss. Uh, and it seems like there's greater cultural universality to look at extreme exposure to stressors versus symptoms. And it's also much less stigmatizing, it's much easier to get access. And we're really looking at things kind of outside your head, not inside your head, so maybe less stigma. And we, we uh, were able to use it and get some validation actually in the tsunami and in, uh, intergovernmental effort between US CDC and the Thai Ministry of Health. So, you know, this kid, let's say some acute disaster, a fire or blood or, you know, even a uh, act of violence, he looks upset. Does he have PTSD in the acute aftermath? This kid, is he calm? Is he chill or is he numb? and avoidant because numbing and avoidance are kind of hallmark aspects of post-traumatic stress disorder. They're very hard to assess, especially in younger kids. So that's why we don't look at symptoms. He could be upset today and fine tomorrow. So that's why a symptom focus uh, isn't sufficient. We plug in, plug and play in an electronic format. Our system is web-based. Uh, other secondary uh, risk factors, and then we color code the uh, findings from green to purple. And then what we've started to do is to line up uh, potential intervention, population level intervention strategies based on the level of risk. And there's some companion efforts that are now going on in schools to improve uh, public school response to kids in all kinds of traumatic events. That's called the multi-tiered system of support. And interestingly enough, it's also kind of color coded and we started to align uh, some tools and strategies to that continuum. And we have a whole model of care. You know, it's available publicly. You can download it. But basically, we go from our triage system, which we're hoping to integrate into uh, pediatric emergency department care, primary care, and schools. Those are really the primary touch points. And then link to um, an appropriate next step. And it's designed to have a floating algorithm. So based on the availability of resource, we can float the algorithm to either favor sensitivity or specificity. 
and we're developing um, sort of color-coded actions for frontline disaster medical providers so they don't have to get into the, the nitty-gritty. Our tool looks at things like were you trapped, unable to evacuate, were you exposed to horrific sounds and sights and uh, uh, you know, uh, sensory exposure to, for example, uh, dead bodies or burns or dismemberment, disfigurement. Were they, are they expressing thoughts that they or would die in the event or still will or their parents or loved ones? Were family members actually seriously injured or killed? Are they unaccompanied at the moment of triage? Are they displaced from their home? Are they displaced from their social support? And those are much easier to get to than symptoms. And uh, we've started an effort here in California and in Washington uh, using this electronically to then link to telebehavioral health using a step model. So four sessions, they're reevaluated clinically, about half are sufficiently improved at that point, the other half uh, still significantly experiencing symptoms of distress, and they go on to the rest of the model. But it's a very uh, more efficient way to de deliver care. And our system then also generates a population level um, visual, which so shows the total distribution of what the triage are, and then the level of comorbidity. So this is showing you the number of kids with one up to seven of the comorbid risk factors. It's showing uh, average acuity over time, and then it breaks it down. Did they lose someone? Did they lose a family member? Did they lose a friend? Did they experience multiple deaths. So we're able to, uh, you know, scale risk on each one of these dimensions. But each one of these major categories target certain kinds of interventions or treatment strategies. And we've just started something new uh, in Sonoma, which is um, a county north of uh, San Francisco that's had uh serious wildfires involving massive evacuation hundreds of thousands of folks um, um loss of life uh, five or six thousand homes destroyed that's pretty significant loss uh in u.s terms and we now have kids that are self-triaging in school and this is very efficient it automatically then sorts the kids in order of severity and then uh, we have virtual case management and they then go on to that telebehavioral health strategy and it maps. So we can see uh, shelters uh, and schools. You can click on each one of those that will kind of tell you what the distribution is. This is in a large fire. This is actually used in Sandy Hook. So it was done by uh, federal disaster medical teams that went into the schools in the 72 hours after the shooting. This is actually in the Boston Marathon bombing, multiple sites. And yeah, I told you about our triage model. So it starts with using our triage system, two algorithms based on availability of resource. Uh, we like to get to the more sensitive, but we started with algorithm one, which picked up uh, favored specificity. So about everyone uh, the system identified actually went on to engage in treatment if they so desired. And then they get something called trauma-focused CBT. That also has free training uh, website uh, you can get access to. The four sessions reevaluated, uh, and then uh, some go on to the full model. So we think all, all by telebehavioral health. So I wish I had more time to tell you about the intervention. It really works on uh, PTSD, depression, externalizing behavioral problems, negative cognitions, and also effective for parents. And we think we can start to line up uh, our triage idea to, this is some of the international work from the ISC on intervention. Again, the idea that uh, how do you know who needs what? How do you do that rapidly? We have some psych first aid models out there. If anybody's interested, just Google Listen, Protect, Connect. It's trained in about an hour. It's the least complicated of the ones we've developed here. And don't forget providers, because we know those that taking care of kids are at risk. And we have some tools and strategies. Actually, a version of our triage system is designed for self-triage by frontline emergency medicine and other critical uh, disaster medical providers. And I think I'm out of time. It's all about implementation and 
pushing things, you know, out into the real world. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Schreiber. Thank you so much, Dr. Schreiber, for this excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh, you are absolutely right. Children suffer in this situation much more than adults, but unfortunately, uh, this effect is not so visible. So it's very important, as you mentioned, to use uh, the appropriate assessment tools, instruments that uh, allow us uh, to identify these children to help them. So thank you so much for this. Uh, um, explanation and now I would like to um, to give uh, uh, the floor to my co-chair Professor uh, Halim to uh, present our second distinguished. Hello everyone. Halim. Uh, it gives me a great pleasure today to uh, welcome you to the webinar and also to introduce our second speaker. Dr. Michelle Nesoyenko. Uh, Dr. Nesoyenko is an attending physician at Boston Children's Hospital Emergency Department, and she is an assistant professor of pediatrics. Uh, she is also the director of the Global Health Program at Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, the Boston Children's Global Health Program works to improve child health globally through partnership with clinical. Uh, quality improvement, education. I'm sorry, you jumped the slide. Can you go back, please? Thank you. Uh, she has uh, experience in pediatric care, quality improvement, program development in China, Lesotho, Guatemala, Liberia, Laos, Indonesia, Iraq, Lebanon, Palestine, Uganda, and Saudi Arabia. She also worked in Turkey and Syria. Uh, in Liberia, Dr. Nasriyanko did a lot of work. She provided pediatric humanitarian aid in the immediate past conflict setting, partnering local remaining infrastructure to US academic institutions for the last 10 years. Through these partnerships, Dr. Nesoyenko's sustainable programs for health system rebuilding, including physician education and care for vulnerable children were developed in Liberia. During the 2014-2017 Ebola outbreak, she led the Liberian Hospital Clinic Health Response utilizing a rapid deployment of training done by both local uh, healthcare workers. Uh, this work continued into Liberia's recovery phase with implementation of a national program for hospital quality improvement and emergency care training. She continued to use her public health and the clinical exp expertise in an outbreak context to support COVID-19 response domestically in the Boston Children's Hospital Emergency Department, Boston Public School System, and globally with the WHO uh, COVID-19 task team. Additionally, she has also conducted hospital system quality assessment in Lebanon, humanitarian health response capacity assessment for the WHO, and consults for the World Bank African Centers for Excellence Program. Uh, her two areas of interest are, number one, provision of healthcare in humanitarian setting through system development, the development of emergency care system for children, and second, looking at outbreak and pandemic response and the preparedness. Uh, Dr. Nesoyenko, thank you very much for joining us, and please, uh, you can start your presentation. Um, thank you, Professor Halim. Um, thanks to everybody for joining today um, in whatever corner of the world you might be in. 
Um, I'm looking forward to discussing with you some of the physical, more medical ailments for children um, and human-made disasters. You know, I think um, uh, Prof at the beginning of this seminar really introduced the broad spectrum of human-made disasters. Today, we're really focusing in on the humanitarian side as Prof Leila has described. And for, for this, it really reflects conflict. Um, and so in our, uh, um, and so to get started, uh, I also wanted to disclose, I have no financial relationships or conflicts of interests. And all the photos that you'll see in this talk were taken with the consent of the people in them. And then a little bit of a disclaimer, um, you know, this is shared expertise. It's learned and it's lived. And I have worked, as you heard, in a lot of different contexts around the world. And I've learned an unbelievable amount from my colleagues globally. Um, and so I share that experience with you in summary, and I wanna acknowledge their teaching of me over time. Um, and also that each and every one of these topics could be a lecture of its own. Um, and so we're gonna to try to give you uh, a high yield session, um, but also this is a difficult subject in a difficult time. Um, take a break if you need to, tune out or tune off um, and take this in small doses, um, you know, beyond today's webinar as well. And so in our short time together, <clears throat> I'd really like to cover with you what categories of ailments affect children. And I think more importantly, where you as pediatricians and pediatric providers can find the resources you need to care for these different conditions. And so to start with a little bit of definition, um, for me, a human-made disaster, formerly known as a man-made disaster, but it involves both genders. And so this is a disaster emergency situation that results in a civilian population's casualties, loss of property, loss of basic services, and means of livelihood as a result of war or civil strife, intentional or unintentional. And this is really closely tied to the definition of humanitarian aid. And humanitarian aid is intended to save lives, alleviate suffering, maintain human dignity during and after man or human made crises and disasters, as well as to prevent and strengthen preparedness for when situations occur again. And this is the system that has to replace other systems when those systems are failing. And so where are children impacted right now? And I'm sure that each and every one of you could come up with a location if it's not even just your own. This is the current World Health Organization or WHO health cluster map. The health cluster is the global body that coordinates health response. And this is their map of active emergencies around the world. Um, this would be no surprise to anybody, but it's really remarkable how many there are at any one time. And when it's health that's affected, it's not just health. All systems really break down in a human-made emergency and all sectors need assistance. And that assistance generally comes externally as defined by the term aid. And coordination is really key. And so in every sector, there's a cluster or a coordinating body. You know, health is our cluster. It's where we as pediatricians participate. But unfortunately, many of the other clusters food security, education, nutrition, protection, shelter, water and sanitation, really significantly impact the health conditions that we see in children. And so I like to think, I'm an ER doctor at heart, so I like to keep things simple, fast, and in categories. And so when I think about the health conditions, I break it into three categories when I'm working in a, in a humanitarian health emergency. It's trauma and injuries, it's the conditions of crowding and scarcity, and it's mental health. And I'll provide sort of an international yin to Professor Shriver's yang of mental health. And so when I think about trauma and injuries, they're sustained directly as part of the conflict. This is what you think of as gun violence, missiles, landmines, or booby trapping, which has become an urban uh, component of warfare. Or after conflict, it's unexploded ordnance or delayed exposure. Um, this is often a persistent threat to children um, on return. They see different objects. They're curious. They want to touch. The bottom right-hand picture here is actually a pile <clears throat> of butterfly landmines. You know, they look like green plastic toys. That's something that a child would want to go and pick up. So when we think about physical elements of trauma, it's really about the pediatric considerations. And I think for us as pediatricians, 
depending on your context, pediatric injury care is really dominated by our surgical colleagues. And oftentimes you may not see this. And so pediatricians, we may be forced or flexed into injury, trauma, or higher acuity care when you know, maybe you're not all emergency providers. And I think understanding the key differences for children, especially when working alongside your adult colleagues, is understanding that smaller body mass, there's less protective fat for insulation and protection. The organs, as we all know, especially the abdominal organs, are very close to the skin level and they're protruding below the ribs with less protection. So children often sustain multiple injuries. Kids, as we all know, have larger heads, so more likely to be injured looser connective tissue for spinal injuries or orthopedic injuries, and a higher body surface area for weight uh, affecting our care for burns. And so in trauma, we always wanna think about a systematized approach. In the United States, our American College of Surgeons provides us ATLS. The concepts are pretty standard of airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure, but ATLS is not necessarily taught all over the world. And so it's important to think about What's the approach in your country and your facility? And recognize there's some other areas of expertise and ways to approach this. The other injury that we don't often encounter as pediatricians is thinking about blast injury. When we think about conflict and violence, this is a primary mechanism that has primary effects, secondary, tertiary, quaternary, and really quaternary. When we see children with blast injuries as a primary injury, it's rupture of the eardrum or tympanic membrane, pneumothorax, pressure rupture of the globe in the eye, concussive symptoms of the brain, or rupture of pressure from the intestines. When we look at secondary, this is our blast patterns where we have projectile objects that cause penetrating injury, can sustain amputations, cause difficult or deep lacerations, head injuries or brain injuries, many of which can be quite catastrophic and result in life-threatening bleeding. In our tertiary patterns, we think about what happens to the patient who's affected. And so the victim is usually propelled from the force, you know, to strike a wall or the ground, struck by debris, or is struck by other objects that are uh, blunt force trauma or crush from something falling on top of the patient, which can then lead to compartment syndromes. In our quaternary blast, we worry about burns, things from fire, inhalation injuries from the dust, smoke, or toxic fumes. This is gonna exacerbate our kids with asthma. It may cause a primary pneumonitis or it can result in long-term lung injury or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease in younger people. This is also our toxins and our chemical gas attacks. And then when we think about our quaternary blast patterns, this is exposures to things like radiation, infection, triggering of hyperinflammatory states on the medical side. And on the social side includes things like the social needs for immediate care, media control, PTSD, and critical incident debriefing for staff. It's also important to note that there's an entire specialty area for chemical, biologic, radiologic, nuclear, and explosive training um, with lots of good open source training through NATO and other UN agencies, as well as online through YouTube. And then when it comes to trauma, as I mentioned, ATLS might not be your country's adopted approach. There was actually recently in the last two years put out the first ever real comprehensive pediatric trauma manual. It was developed by the Imperial College London, Save the Children Working Together. It's open source. You just Google it, Pediatric Blast Injury Field Manual. And this is an actual applicable approach to not just blast injury, but general trauma. And it's the only open source pediatric specific trauma guide out there. Um, a great resource, I'd recommend taking a look at it. When we move into our sort of second condition, second set of conditions, again, my first bucket is trauma injuries. My second category is conditions of crowding and scarcity. Um, conflict causes displacement, people are on the move. And that leads to crowding in improvised or rapidly evolving living situations. So this could be people moving in with other families being hosted. This could be informal settlements or camps. This could be formalized refugee camps or um, apartment blocks, depending on your location. But when people are crowded together, often without an increase in food, water, or supply availability, this leads us to infectious disease outbreaks, 
resurgences of vaccine preventable disease and the medical effects of scarcity. And so again, it's not just health that's affected. In crowding and scarcity, we see that food source plays a key uh, role, uh, leads to malnutrition, nutrition itself, and then shelter and camp management for crowding and hygiene and sanitation, as well as wash or water and sanitation and hygiene, um, leading to increased infectious disease when those systems are not, uh, not adequate. When we think about infectious disease outbreaks, there's some great open source manuals. So uh, Medicine Sans Frontières or Doctors Without Borders, MSF has put out a refugee health guide that gets updated on a regular basis. It gives you the quick and practical health uh, care recommendations for sort of the core infectious disease outbreaks we're gonna see that we're hopefully doing public health surveillance for, meningitis, hepatitis, typhoid, influenza, gastroenteritis, cholera, scabies, and then depending on your context, you may see increase of the neglected top tropical diseases like leishmaniasis, trypanosomiasis, something to be aware of depending on your location. We're also gonna to start to see the longer a situation goes on, increase in vaccine preventable disease. Uh, you start to see measles outbreaks. Measles is so contagious, the definition of a measles outbreak by WHO is just one single case. For every one case you have, you're going to have 100 more. It spreads like wildfire. And so looking out for measles, pertussis, you'll start to see tetanus and even the resurgence of polio. And so I was uh, lucky enough to be working with UN OCHA in 2014, supporting the Syria response when they undertook their nationwide polio campaign, which was just an amazing effort of the community health workers. And then we have scarcity. Um, scarcity of food and resources will lead to malnutrition. And it's something that we as pediatricians, depending on our practice setting, may not always see. And so being familiar and ready to treat acute malnutrition, um, either mild through ready-use therapeutic foods or RUTF, um, or severe, which requires inpatient hospitalized management using medical formulas and then transitioning to oral foods and moderate kind of the continuum in between is really important. There's a great manual on the hospital care for children put out by WHO. Uh, the last edition is 2013. It's actually currently undergoing revision. And so look for a new edition soon, but it gives you a step-by-step -step profiles guide for how to practically do this in your setting. And this helps us avoid the chronic effects, which has a lot of neurodevelopmental outcome as we all know as pediatricians, where when children sustain wasting and stunting, their overall growth and development is affected and then the neurodevelopment outcomes of having chronic anemia untreated. And then we come to my third category, mental health, which I think we all feel it as the tip of the iceberg right now that we're starting to finally see the bottom of what's underneath the surface. I break it into two categories are sort of our long-term effects of physical trauma. Um, in the study of physical trauma, um, these kids are more likely to have brain injuries and affects their long-term school performance, mood disturbances and disorders. Kids who've got fractures, limb length, amputations can develop body image issues long-term. And then in looking at kids who've sustained severe multi-system trauma, so physical injuries, up to 60% have personality changes afterwards and 50% show cognitive or physical handicaps. And then the incidence of post-traumatic stress disorder. And when we think about mental health, it's not just uh, the health sector. This is you know, education. That's a primary support system for kids. Protection. So making sure children are with their families, they're reunified as quickly as possible, or they're maintained in a child safe and child friendly space until that can occur. It's food security, not knowing where your next meal is coming from and the stress of hunger and it's nutrition. And so in the, uh, this is a good sort of end to finish out, um, as Dr. Schreiber just described the end of his talk, um, in the international system, we sort of use this pyramid of uh, four levels of uh, intervention in mental health and psychosocial support or MSH, MHPSS. We think about the base of that triangle as the core services and security. This is meeting people's basic needs food, medical care, shelter, education. And for our population, it's specifically child-friendly and trauma-informed. 
And so I think of it as how do you take the MHPSS triangle pyramid and deliver all the services the clusters need to in a way that respects the rights of the child um, through that are established in the UN Convention on Rights of the Child around dignity, protection, maintaining their family environment, and ensuring they can maintain their cultural values. We also look at then the next level of the pyramid in community and family support. And so again, this is where maintaining family units, reunification as quickly as possible, and then providing the supports that families need, housing together, sheltering the same space, while then developing the community structures for children as part of the response. And so this ensures having a school. You know, this is a school in a tent, but it's school. Those kids are smiling, they're learning, they're engaged. It's having playgrounds or play spaces, play in youth groups, building arts and sports into the structures and whatever response is being done, and then engaging the community for participation. So util utilizing the feedback um, from kids and adolescents on delivery of the services wherever you can. We also look at then that sort of third level of the pyramid as we get more and more narrow is really focused psychosocial support. And this can be emotional support at an individual level, family level, a group level, whether it's community group, housing group, physical location. And then it's also practical support. You know, it's very stressful to navigate a new system. You know, if any of us have traveled to other countries or other cultures where we don't speak the language, we don't have a system, it's stressful. And so for, for people to navigate getting medical care or receiving aid that they're entitled to, the cash programs or whatever it may be, having that practical support to relieve the burden of having to figure everything out yourself is really important. Um, Professor Schreiber also alluded to psychological first aid. Um, this is important when we're providing medical care. Um, what it is, is the bottom three components of the pyramid, but what it's not is actual mental health care. It's not debriefing, counseling, therapy, diagnosis, or treatment. You know, that's not my area of expertise, although we as pediatricians more and more are being asked to flex into the mental health world. And so the clinical services at the top of the pyramid are really focused on those who have a, who need a diagnosis or have a diagnosis of a true mental health condition, PTSD, psychosis, depression, suicidality, and then is on the provision of treatment through debriefing, counseling, therapy, medication, and this is for the true mental health clinicians. Um, this is something that we as pediatricians then need to interface with as we think about medical care for children. And recognizing that some of our children may manifest physical symptoms as signs of their mental health uh, conditions. And so in summary, we had a very short time together, but as pediatricians, we can learn about and participate in the global system to ensure that kids are getting the medical care they need. We can expand our clinical practice to reach into areas that we may not always want to or have to. And we can advocate for the system solutions while meeting children's uh, unique needs. And so I wanna thank you guys for having me join you. One of my favorite aspects of working with colleagues around the world is sharing a meal. Um, I wish we were all in person, we could share a meal together, but uh, this is a great team I worked with uh, sharing the sort of local specialty of Masabaha um, in, uh, in one of our hospitals. And so I will look forward to joining my colleagues for question and answer. Thank you, Dr. Nesaryanko, for this excellent talk. Uh, we really appreciate you sharing your expert expertise with us. And uh, now I believe we are going to open it uh, for questions. The first question, in case of disaster, especially when children are separated from parents, how do we deal with the psychological impact of separation? Uh, Dr. Nesoyenko? Um, I think this is around creating the environment to uh, receive children in. 
And so, you know, in a situation where globally children may be separated from their caregivers, having safe child spaces where kids can play, can engage with each other, who have safe and vetted adults to provide them the either basic care of their young children, so feeding, clothing, sanitation, um, or support and structure for older children um, is really the core principle when we have kids separated in a global setting. Um, you know, I would defer to Professor Schreiber here in the United States on how we do reunification and sort of the support we provide there. Um, I don't know if you have any comments. Yeah, so I think you covered kind of the basics. Um, I think the key issue about separation is to really have communities and providers uh, be the advocates for thinking about this in advance. Uh, it's really something that requires uh, multi-sector collaboration, and it's pretty hard to do that in the midst of a large event. The larger the event, more complicated it is to do, and the more likely you've got numbers of kids that are separated or family members are missing. So part of it is kind of on the prevention side to really try to think that through. And this has been a major challenge here in the US because of our patient confidentiality issues. Um, uh, there is a almost phobic reluctance for healthcare settings to share information uh, with each other. And we do have um, a strategy in the US related to aviation incidents where basically the government forces entities to share information on the location of uh, those that were directly involved in an aviation incident. So this is where uh, it's a large commercial incident. That's, that's really the only mandated um, national uh, strategy for uh, you know, family reunification, if you will, that's out there. There's actually some colleagues uh, including uh, one of our colleagues uh, from Children's Hospital Boston, uh, Dr. Sarita Chung, that's led an effort by the American Academy of Pediatrics on family reunification, which I think kind of subsumes the separation uh, piece of it. Uh, and that's available uh, really at no cost. Um, I could probably put that link into the chat if you want. So, you know, part of it is to have a strategy. Once it's occurred, it's really about designation of who's gonna keep kids safe until you know, the reunification can occur. However, there's gonna be subsets. It's not one size fits all. Some of those kids uh, potentially have lost their family. Their, their family members did not survive the incident and or they're uh, you know, sufficiently injured medically that they're hospitalized, they're in ICU care, they're not able to care for their kids. So that's kind of one subset of the population. There's others where the status of the parent uh, and vice versa, it's also supporting the parents who are separated from their kids. Um, it's kind of a whole family solution to that challenge. The other is where, you know, family, the whereabouts are unknown. So what are you gonna do when you already know, have information that the family did not survive? How do you locate next of kin? And I can tell you here in the US, it's not well sorted out. Um, you know, we have um, what we call emergency support functions in the US uh, disaster plan. And one of them is uh, uh, sheltering and kind of the reunification and separation kind of falls to, it's called ESF-6, to the sheltering operation. Well, you know, a lot of places just haven't, because of the complexity of this, they haven't dealt with that. American Red Cross has started to create that safe space that our colleague was mentioning about. They've contracted with a group where they're able to vet uh, those that are watching kids and they have activities, standardized activities, and they're they're able to deploy uh, in some events. So that's my so, quick comments to that. So it really, uh, I think what I can sum it up from listening to both of you is it, there has to be a system. There has to be a disaster management system that's well organized that 
their response to a disaster will be in an organized, well thought out and well vetted uh, plan that can help them avoid those issues by developing the intervention structure upfront. Is that a fair assumption? Yes. Thank you. Uh, and I have also one uh, small note. Um, I think that uh, now is the time uh, to include more information about all these topics in uh, student curricula, because so we see that uh, um, uh, students who are graduating universities are very far from all this information, and they don't understand that uh, some uh, of group, uh, uh, I mean, uh, children, for example, handicapped or disabled are more vulnerable in many uh, conditions, especially in those that we discussed today. So I think that it's very important issue to, uh, to include uh, all this information more widely in different curricula. So thank you. Dr. Namazova, do you wanna take the second question, please? Um, there is also a question from our audience uh, about this uh, terrible situation with some uh, medication uh, that uh, we, we had read uh, last month, uh, last weeks uh, in some uh, countries. Uh, what is the, the opinion of our distinguished uh, lectures of today? Uh, what is um, what you do? What do you think about this issue? I think that it's uh, maybe uh, um, only. Uh, uh, one aspect question, but it's very important to many of our colleagues uh, around the world. I think this, um, maybe I'll comment first. This, uh, this question has a, a couple of different perspectives to it. I think, you know, in just the general setting, in um, when we think about cough medicines in children, at least um, in the United States, there's been a lot of research that's looked at the effectiveness of cough medication as well as its testing. Um, on the safety, <clears throat> safety and efficacy in children. And in general, the US practice has actually moved away from using cough medicines. Um, the side effect profiles and the FDA, our federal drug uh, regulations of it are not as stringent as they could be for sort of the little benefit that we have. And so most US pediatricians have moved away from sort of cough and cold medicines as recommended by the AAP, especially for young children under the age of six. So I think there's some, some global opportunity to think about globally as pediatricians, what do we recommend? What does the evidence say? And there's a lot of context where this has not been tested or validated, which then somewhat leads to in certain countries, when I think about the Gambia, I'm actually headed there next week. You know, Gambia is a very small country that has, you know, a small office of food and drug regulation, small office of you know, each government function. And so how can they possibly be re relied on to regulate every single medication and know the data on every medication coming in the country? It's a Herculean task. Um, and so you know, suppliers bring in medications, there's the systems, but these systems are challenging. Um, things come in, you know, in a large country like Indonesia, you have a huge geographic spread. Um, I had the privilege of working um, with Indonesian collaborators uh, back in 2013 and, you know, the movement of medications in and out similarly. And so I think globally we have lots of regulatory challenges. And I think in a humanitarian emergency, that's somewhat exacerbated. You know, there's an effort to move quickly, move supply. There's a lot of goodwill. People are looking to buy things, send it immediately. You know, we just most, most recently saw this with Ukraine. Everybody was looking to buy medications and ship them. The only thing that limited that response was the fact that many medications cannot transit through the EU because the regulations are much tighter. And that provided a layer of safety that we don't often see in other contexts where medications are just purchased and, and sent whenever possible with good intention, but often side effects and complications. And so, you know, speed is important, but safety is also really important as well. And so in our humanitarian response, it's a balance of supply chains and global response systems with safety and regulation. 
And so, which I think is hard. I think people see emergency happening and they want to do something immediately. And sometimes that can, can lead to, you know, irreputable suppliers or, you know, accidental contaminations that were undetected otherwise. And so I think this is kind of a multifaceted question where we as pediatricians need to think about what is our recommendation around certain over-the-counter medications and what is the testing of those medications in children? And it turns out it's very limited globally. And then secondarily, in a humanitarian or a supply chain context, we have to ensure that we use the vetted systems for purchasing to avoid accidental contamination or low quality products entering the market. Because where there's a will or where there's a dollar to be made, companies will enter that space. I would like only thank to you. continue in some words. Uh, thank you so much. Um, you know, we have a very famous uh, sentence uh, from uh, our um, doctor of uh, 19th century. What is not shown is contraindicated. As an allergist, I can tell you that we have a lot of side effects for those uh, medications that are not shown for, for the patient. And uh, I know also that uh, there is a big, big problem uh, with the polypharmacy in some countries. And when we uh, discuss uh, the real um, therapy, the real um, uh, treatments that children uh, are needed, uh, uh, this list uh, doesn't include all these, uh, you know, medications that have that have a lot of uh, side effects. So thank you so much for your, for your, um, as a sharing of your opinion. And I think that now we have uh, to close the session of question uh, questions and answers, and we give uh, the floor back to our organizers. We extend our warmest round of applause and appreciation to our honorable speakers and of course to our moderators for the incredible and eye-opening discussion. As a token of our gratitude, we will now present certificates to our honorable speakers who have contributed greatly to our learning process today. To present the certificate, we now invite Professor Aman Pulungan, Dr. Halim Henes, Professor Leila Namazova Baranova, Dr. Oslim Teksam, and Dr. Abdul Salam Abdulipte. To our speakers, kindly turn your video on and smile as we spotlight you alongside your certificate. Thank you, Dr. Schreiber. Thank you. I'm honored to present to you today. Thank you. Thank you all for your excellent job. We will now be taking the photo once all the speakers and guests have been spotlighted. Thank you for this great experience. Three, two, one. Three, two, one. Three, two. Thank you very much, doctor. We'll now proceed to the second certificate. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nisiren. Thank you for letting me join you. I really enjoyed my time with you all today. Thank you. I will now be taking the photo. Three, two, one. Three, two, one. Thank you very much, doctor. Of course, no event is complete without a photo session. We now invite all our honorable guests, speakers, and moderators to turn your videos to take a group photo. So all the participants as well, kindly turn your videos to take a group photo with all our distinguished speakers and moderators. Let us give a few seconds for everyone to turn their videos on if it's possible. Three, two, one. Three, two, one. We will take more photos with the participants. Three, two, one. Three, two. That concludes today's photo session. Once again, on behalf of the organizing committee, we would like to extend our warmest round of gratitude and appreciation to all our speakers, moderators, and participants for making the international webinar a great success. To all the participants, please kindly fill in the feedback form as detailed on the slides and has been sent via the Zoom and YouTube chat. The certificate of attendance will be shared via email upon completion of the feedback form. Furthermore, the International Pediatric Association also conducts routine webinars with a wide range of topics concerning child health. To keep your 
yourself up to date, we urge you to follow IPA on our social media platforms as detailed on the slide. We also have several opportunities for you to participate in IPA webinar and activities. First, IPA will be having the IPA Congress next year in 2023. For more details, log on to www.ipa2023congress.org. IPA also provides opportunities for healthcare workers to enroll in the IPA Vaccine Trust course to become a certified vaccine champion. The course is open to all healthcare workers for free. Refer to the post and the IP website for more information. We also have another upcoming webinar on the 2nd of December, 2022, entitled Practical Approaches to Improving Teaching and Learning in Busy Clinical Settings. Stay tuned to IPA social media channels for more information. Once again, warmest round of gratitude to all parties who have made this webinar a great success. Thank you, and we hope to see you at the next webinar.